Good day, great of learners. Welcome to today's business studies lesson. My name is Tedis Otlaka. This program is brought to you by the Houghton Department of Education in partnership with Saipono Discovery Center. Today we're looking to now the impact of recent legislation on the business and the focus of the legislation or act would be your skills development, the consumer protection and the National Credit Act and I'm the presenter. Cities of Tlaka. Learning outcomes. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to explain the purpose of the acts we'll be looking into. We'll also look into discussing the impact of those acts together with recommending ways in which businesses can comply with these acts and we'll discuss actions regarded as discriminatory by the acts. And then we'll also look into explaining penalties or consequences for non compliance. And then we will further look into explaining the National Skills Development Strategy and the Human Resource Development Strategy as per the skills development. And then we'll also explain or discuss the role or functions of sectors, which is your sector education and training authorities. We will also explain how sector education and training authorities are funded together with defining or elaborating on the meaning of learnerships. And then we'll also recommend consumer rights according to the National Credit Act. And we'll also recommend consumer rights according to the Consumer Protection Act. And this becomes a very, very essential part of our lesson because the consumer rights, when you're looking into the National Credit Act and consumer protection, they are forever assessed when you're looking into those two consumer laws. Now, pre-knowledge previously in term one, and when we did our prelim revision as well, because this lesson, you should take it as a revision as well. We looked into the Skills Development Act. We looked into the Labor Relations Act. We looked into the Employment Equity Act together with the Basic Conditions of Employment Act. And we also uh, looked into the Broad-Based Black Economic Empowerment Act together with Compensation for Occupational Injuries and Disease Act. So those were legislations that we looked into. However, now, we will look into basement to say, can you remember what we did? Can you remember how you will be assessed and the ways in which you should respond or the approach you should uh, apply when you're looking into maybe a section B question such as a, a scenario based or a statement based type of a question. We have Capri Enterprise and Capri Enterprise offers uh, uh, recruitment services. They have black people in their management structure Moreover, they sell shares to their black employees. Now we have a question there which says now identify the act applicable to Capri Enterprise and then motivate your answer by quoting from the scenario. So if you have such a question in your section B, what is expected from you is to identify the act. And what will help you to identify the act is the components or the key areas of focus for the different acts. We should know that we look into the purpose of the act, we look into the impact of the act together with ways to comply with the act, and we also look into discriminatory actions according to the act. And then we also look into the focus area whereby we look into the penalties for non-compliance. So those aspects will be used in the scenario. So as you look into Capri Enterprise, they have black people in their management structure and they also sell shares to their black employees. So out of the acts, you should know what are the key aspects or what is the main aim of each act for you to be in a better position to answer some of the scenario based questions. So when you're looking into Capri Enterprise, this act that is applied by Capri Enterprise is an act that talks about now ensuring that there's equal distribution of wealth because it's, it's talking about ensuring that black people in management positions are, are there in the business and it also talks about selling shares now to what to black people so that would ensure equal distribution of wealth that they, they, that would ensure that uh, we have uh, uh, different parts of our country or different races uh, are occupying different positions in the workplace and also being part and parcel of the ownership of the business. So the act that would be applicable according to this scenario would be the broad, a broad based the broad based black 
economic empowerment and then how do you quote you can either use the first sentence after the, the the initial sentence explained what they offer you can use this as your motivation to say they have black people in their management structure Now, that is one way you can motivate to say this act is applicable or this act is the correct one according to the identification because now it talks about broad-based black economic empowerment. How do you motivate? According to the scenario, it is talking about black people being in management position and there's only one act that talks about empowering those who were previously disadvantaged by seeing them in management positions. Now, terminology that is important for this act is the term compliance or ways to comply which now should be looked into as acting according to the set of rules. So the business is expected to act according to the set of rules that would be outlined by the by, by each act. And then we also look into penalties to say now what would happen to a business that does not follow the rules or a business that does not comply. Then they have to suffer the punishment. So penalties refers to punishment for doing something that is against the law. The legislation is developed and if the business does not comply with the legislation, then they are not, they are basically being or doing something that is against the law and then discipline uh, discriminatory action when you're looking into that it refers to treating people or a person differently from the way in which you treat others or other people so that is also part and parcel of uh, 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 the lesson there because we should look into that now Remember legislations we have, we have the Skills Development, we have the Labor Relations Act together with the Employment Equity Act and the Basic Conditions of Employment Act together with Compensation for Occupational Injuries and Disease together with the Broad-Based Black Economic Empowerment Act and we have the National Credit Act together with the Consumer Protection. Where is the focus of our lesson? We will be looking into these three legislations on how businesses can comply and we'll also look into discriminatory action and then look into the impact to say what are the advantages of the businesses that comply and what are the disadvantages of businesses that do not comply with these legislations now Skills development is the first act we're going to look into because this is labor law. So when you're looking into labor law, it means it deals with workers within the workplace. So the main aim of this act is to improve the skill levels of people who are already employed in the business. Why was this act developed? Because uh, back in the apartheid system, then there were uh, individuals who were disadvantaged were not able to improve their skills who only had to depend or who only had to use their semi skills to be able to make money so the skills development act was developed by the government to ensure that now they try to improve or try to make sure that those who were previously disadvantaged or who could not get training during the apartheid system would get an opportunity hence it talks about the skills level improving uh, or for people who are already employed in the business so this is only applicable to people who are already working because they cannot go back to school they need to be trained within their working uh, their working space then let us look into the focus then the focus will be on the the purpose of the skills development, the impact of the skills development act, which is in summary we can call SDA. We'll also look into the discriminatory action, ways to comply together with penalties for non-compliance and roles of setters, together with funding of setters, the meaning of learnership, together with national skills development strategy and human resource development strategy. So those are the aspects we'll be addressing when you're looking into skills development. Now, let's start with the first part, the purpose 
what is the purpose the purpose is the aim of the act the aim is to develop the skills of people in south africa in order to improve productivity productivity within the businesses of south africa so immediately you improve the skills of your employees it means their product chain level will increase meaning the amount of products that can be produced per day would increase because of the skill level that shall have been gained by those employees and then the the the, the other purpose is to invest in education and training of workers and the other one is to improve the chances of getting jobs for people who are previously disadvantaged so this is to say because there were individuals that were previously disadvantaged and the system that made those individuals to be disadvantaged was the government uh, system that was there before 1994 so the aim of now the the, the 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 act was to improve the chances of getting jobs for people who were previously disadvantaged another one it was to encourage workers to participate in learning programs and then the other one was to redress the imbalances of the past through education and training so when we're talking about the past it is important to talk maybe about the timeline to say this act is developed in line with what before this will say this is 1994 and then this is before 1994 before 1994 which would be the apartheid system and then 1994 the legislations are developed skills development for instance sda why sda to improve the skills of people in south africa and then also to get jobs for previously disadvantaged and also redresses the imbalances of the past in the past some uh, group of races within the nation or within south africa would not have advantages to improve their skills so this is developed the sda is developed just after 1994 to ensure that now the improvement of skills for those who were previously disadvantaged can be addressed hence we consider it to be redressing the imbalances of the past through education and training now let us look into the impact the positives for businesses that would apply this act and the negatives because each in each and everything that is being implemented by the business we will look into the positives and negatives to say how will it benefit the business and what can be the challenges when it comes to implementing such an act so the positives is that train it trains employees to improve productivity in the workplace so what are we talking about when we are looking into this this weight productivity this weight comes from the word produce and what does produce mean it means to make so from produce we can talk about production so when we are talking about production what is production now this is to make in large quantities production is the process of making in large quantities and then when we are talking about productivity now productivity is to ensure that there's less waste and more output so output meaning more products are going to be produced so this is to say when you train employees what is going to happen is that your employees are going to be skilled that is the positive so as your employees are skilled they are able to be productive which is to ensure that there's less waste within them or business so there'll be less waste when it comes to making the product and more output meaning more products being produced so that is the first advantage for a business and then another one it promotes self-employment and black entrepreneurship so this is to say now this benefits the workers will be getting the skill from the act or from the training that will be taking place because of the act 
So when we are looking into promoting now self-employment and black entrepreneurship, we are saying those who were previously disadvantaged, if it happens that now the business is no longer able to operate or the business is liquidated, they'll be in a better position to use their skills to create their own businesses or to become their own uh, 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 to become self-employed so that they are better able to run their own business. So that is another advantage. And what will allow those employees to basically have the skill to to basically have the skill to to have self-employment and black entrepreneurship is what it is it is the skill that they shall have learned when they were doing their the skills development programs and then. Furthermore, the workplace is used as an active learning environment where employees can gain practical job experiences. So that becomes another advantage for the business because as now the business is using their working environment as an active learning environment for those who don't have experience, they end up gaining practical job experience, which later on will benefit the business so the benefit obviously will be because of the issue of productivity and then what are the negatives so this has to do with now anything that wastes time that wastes money for the business those are negatives those are challenges and anything that affects the effectiveness of the business we consider all those aspects to be negatives because anything that wastes money anything that wastes time and anything that stops the business from operating without any problems then uh, it is a disadvantage so skills development levies could be an extra burden for financially struggling businesses so what are we talking about when we are looking into your skills development levy this is the contribution that is paid out this is the contribution paid out paid out by the business it is the contribution paid out by the business in order for them to be able to have access to training of employees so this becomes a challenge because it has cost implications for the business it costs the business because the business should be operating to make sure that they attract more customers but instead they are complying with the law which requires them to pay money so as they pay money it means they have high cost high expenses so that becomes a challenge for the business because the levy would be an extra financial burden for a struggling business who maybe just started operating or maybe a business that just started uh, for instance uh, operating and then another negative is that it increases the cost as the process requires again large amounts of paperwork which we also consider to be time consuming in the process and then another one is that implementation of the skills development act can be difficult to monitor and control because as we expect uh, businesses expect employees to be working during the waking hours but then because of skills development it means now they have to be trained and while they are trained it means production is suffering and then while they are trained another challenge is that the business has to monitor the training and that process becomes difficult because the business is not uh, we cannot consider the business to be expertise at training because training takes place in the learning institution so that becomes a challenge to monitor and control if the training is really really working or not or will it benefit the business or not and then we look into now discriminatory actions according to the skills development act so discriminatory actions are basically actions that would discriminate employees maybe from receiving training opportunities that would be considered uh, as discrimination because every employee should have access to training that takes place in the employees so preventing employees from signing a learnership due to their age or position in the workplace is considered to be discrimination because we should not use the issue of age or position whether the position is is, is is important or essential the employee has to get access to the training because they have a right to do so and then unfair promotion of skills development or training to certain employees is also considered to be discriminatory because everyone should know about training opportunities that are happening within the organization then 
providing employees, uh, 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 providing employment services for gain without being registered as an employer is also considered to be a discriminatory action because it means this business will not pay towards the contributions or levies that the skills development is having and then furnishing false information in any prescribed document is also considered to be discriminatory because the business for instance has to come up with uh, uh, the content to be learned or uh, the books that will be used for the training to take place so if it happens that whatever information in those books is, do, is not relevant then it means this is discriminatory because the business is actually making sure that employees do not learn any new skill that might benefit them in the future so these actions are considered to be discriminatory and they can lead to the business uh, having to suffer punishment or being considered as being non-compliant then ways to comply this is how the business has to comply now. The employer who collects pay as you earn should register with setters. What are setters? These are your sector education and training authorities. They are basically in charge of the training that will take place within the working environment. So the employer has to pay or has to collect pay as you earn and should register with the setters. That's the first step of compliance. Another compliance way is to now pay the one percent so one percent of the employer's payroll has to be paid over to the setters remember when we were looking into the negative impact we said the negative impact of this act is that the businesses that are financially struggling can have an extra burden when you're looking into the skills development because they have to pay one percent of their employer's payroll towards the setters and remember the point was saying they are already financially struggling so that becomes difficult it becomes a negative for that particular business to comply with this act so that's what we were trying to say when we're looking into the negatives to say the cost increases because the business has to pay one percent of their employer's payroll and then another one is that businesses should register with the sars in the area in which their business is classified in in terms of the setters so remember that setters are the category of the business uh, sectors which is your primary secondary and tertiary so if a business is for instance if you are having a hotel business that business has to be registered under the tertiary sector and then when you're looking into your manufacturing businesses then they have to be registered in the secondary sector so another way to comply with setters with the skills development is to ensure that businesses are registered with SARS in the area in which the business is classified whether primary secondary or tertiary and and then another way to comply employees should submit a workplace skills plan and provide evidence that it was implemented what is a workplace skills plan a workplace skills plan is a plan that shows uh, the learning objectives that the business wants to cover or is a plan that shows the training that the business wants to conduct within their working environment and then after submitting that plan the business later on if they say the program that they are having is six months they should make sure that now after the six months they provide evidence that it was implemented to say there was a learnership that was done within the organization it was for six months these were the skills that uh, the employees learned and then after that they provide evidence to say this was covered within the working uh, space and then businesses with more than 50 employees must appoint a skills development facilitator. A skills development facilitator is a person who will be looking into the process of training to say is the training taking place in accordance to the plan or are the skills being learned in the workplace uh, relevant or equivalent to the actual uh, business or the business sector. And then these are ways in which a business can comply with the skills development and then penalties for non-compliance businesses that do not pay the skills development levy may not offer learnerships or claim grants from the skills development act so as the business now pays these levies if it happens that the business does not pay the levies then they are not in a position to offer learnerships or claim from the grants that 
the uh, skills development act has so they are not in a position to do so that is one of the punishment and then another one a labor inspector could order the business to stop operating should the business be found guilty of illegal practices and then another, those are penalties for non-compliance then we look into setters let's explain what is the function of the setters let's explain what are the setters so setters basically are the sector education and training authorities this is basically a, an organization that ensures that they monitor training or education that is taking place within the working environment so they will look into their specific sectors which is the primary secondary and tertiary sector so they'll look into primary secondary and tertiary then look into saying now how do they ensure that training takes place effectively within those three business sectors so the first role of this organization is to report to the director general that is one and then another one is to promote and establish learnerships they need to promote and establish leadership for the different sectors primary secondary and tertiary Furthermore, they need to collect levies and pay out grants as required. So paying out levies is done by the business. Businesses pay and then after paying to the setters, then the setters receive or they collect. And then when the business now needs to train some of the employees, then they can ask for a grant from the setters. And then the setters issues out now a grant to the business that is complying. So one of their roles is to collect the 1% from the businesses and it's also to pay out grants as required furthermore they provide accreditation for skills development facilities facilitators so setters are basically going to appoint facilitators or people who would oversee or overlook at the training that is taking place within the workplace which is your now skills development facilitators these will be the monitors who will be coming from the setter coming into a business maybe shoprite is having training then a facilitator from the setters would come and check if the training that is done by shoprite is accurate or not and then they will register learners agreements or learning programs and then another one is to approve workplace skills plan and annual training reports as i said a way to comply the businesses to ensure that they develop a skills development plan thereafter they need to submit the report or submit evidence that evidence becomes now a report of the training so the roles of setters is to say when the businesses submit is submitting the skills plan they approve and they also have the power to decline to say these skills are not relevant and then when you're looking into the report again after the business now has done training they submit the evidence in a form of a report that report can be approved or uh, disapproved to, to disapproved disapproved by the uh, the annual training report so those are your setters then funding of setters how are this or how is this organization being funded the skills development levy is paid by employers e.g 80 percent will then be distributed to the different setters and 20 percent is paid into the national skills fund so skills development levies uh, are paid by the employer so this is that one percent we spoke about to say the businesses to pay one percent of their payroll and then the donations and grants from the public is also another way in which setters are funded and then surplus funds from the government institutions and then we also look into funds received from services or rendering their services and then this is ways in which they get the income and then we also have the term learnership. What do we mean by the term learnership? This is a theoretical or practical training opportunity that can lead to recognized occupational qualifications and then a structured learning program completed during the work hours for a specified period of time. And then we also we can also define it as an agreement between a learner or a trainee employer and a training provider. And then it may include employment for a specified period after the leadership is completed. That is your leadership over there. Then, the meaning of the National Skills Development Strategy, it increases access 
do programs that train people. That's one. It promotes the public FET college system that has programs to meet the skills needed by the setters, local, regional, provincial, or national organizations. So when you're looking into national skills development strategy, it is a plan by the government to try to ensure that there's access to training programs, meaning there's schools, there's uh, 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 adult education systems, there's adult education institutions that are there. Hence, when you're looking into it, it promotes public FET college systems that has programs that meet the needs needed or skills needs needed by the setters, local, uh, regional or provincial together with national. So those are aspects that now the government is trying to ensure or it is the national skills development strategy, a strategy, a plan of action to solve the what now, the issue of literacy within South Africa. Make sure that there's more places actually we can put it in the same simplest way to say make sure the government is trying to make sure that there's more places where training and, and education can take place and then they address the low level of language and mathematical skills amongst the youth and adults by making sure that we do not only limit the education system to being university when you're looking into tertiary, but then we also have college uh, systems that ensure that there's training opportunities or there's training taking place there. This makes better use of the workplace based skills development and then we look into the human resource development strategy now. This is a strategy developed to address the skills shortage in the South African workforce. Another way is it aims at achieving faster economic growth or higher employment levels and reduces the levels of poverty. And then another one is to promote social, uh, social development or social justice and it helps to alleviate poverty because the aim with the human resource development strategy now this has to do with making sure that uh, the people who are skilled have skills that are relevant to whatever industry that we have in south africa hence it addresses the skills shortage in south africa to ensure that we see faster economic growth or higher employment levels because it means now they would make sure that skills that are there are relevant and are skills that are needed and then it promotes social development or social justice because it will alleviate poverty and then it develops short-term and long-term workforce skills then we also look into then this will mark the end of our skills development but then we have now the two consumer laws that are applicable which is your consumer protection act and your national credit act if i may ask a question why do you think the government developed these two consumer laws because these are consumer laws these are laws that are not focused on the employees but they are highly focused on now the 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 the, the, the consumers me and you when we are going to shop right me and you when we are going to pick and pay me and you when we are going to any uh, uh, service right rendering business so this is why these uh, laws were developed to ensure that you are protected from any uh, transaction that may be unfair to you now we start with the national credit act the act was introduced to protect consumers against unfair and reckless credit granting by businesses so that is your national credit act now what are we going to focus on the purpose of the act, the impact, discriminatory action, penalties for non-compliance, and ways to comply together with the consumer rights according to the National Credit Act. Why? 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 The purpose now. Why was it developed? The purpose was to ensure that they promote a fair but competitive credit market a fair meaning to grant people credit if they are suitable and if they qualify because sometimes people qualify but they don't afford so when you're talking about promoting a fair and a competitive market it addresses such and then it makes provision for the establishment of the national credit regulator 
which controls the minimum income needed for maybe a minimum credit application to be approved. So it makes provision for the National Credit Regulator or the NCR. It promotes the social and financial interests of consumers. As I repeat, a factor that is very, very important to say in the process of buying goods for credit, some people, yes, do qualify, but they do not afford. So it ensures that it promotes the social and financial Financial interest of the consumer to say yes you qualify but you don't afford so if you don't afford it then the business may not take a risk by offering you credit because that will lead to now a bad credit record if later on you are failing now to afford to pay whatever credit you shall have received for from a business and then it also now ensures that consumers know what is included in their credit contracts because sometimes businesses would agree to credit contracts even though they have or they do not qualify so it prevents discrimination and ensures that credit is available to all consumers again because in the past some consumers could not get access to credit maybe because of their race maybe because of their levels of income the impact, what are the positives for the business and what are the negatives? Because to some extent, this will benefit the business because it means the business will be in a better position to grant credit to only those who qualify and afford, not to those who qualify but who will not afford later on. So what are the positives? Low bad debts resulting in better cash flow. What are we talking about when we're looking to bad debts? We're talking about now debtors or consumers who would fail to pay off their debts or their credit obligation so it will lead to low bad debts so that would mean the business would have better cash flow because more money would be coming in than money that has went out but that is not coming in to the business because when you buy something on credit it means you are taking a product maybe for instance that is worth 50,000 and saying you're gonna receive that 50,000 maybe after three years so it means low bad debts would be really reduced because there's few people who will get credit because it will only give credit or access to credit would be granted to only those who qualify so that is the first positive it protects businesses again against non-paying consumers so when you're looking into that it makes sure that businesses do not grant or give credit to non-paying consumers because the database would be there a database is developed to check the credit record of all the consumers as they try to buy on credit and then authorized credit providers may attract more consumers because it allows for more consumers to buy goods and then another positive is that it leads to more consumers through credit sales as they are now protected by from abuse so the business is now able to sell more to the consumers even those who don't afford now but they will be able to afford because the issue is now they will not be able to buy cash but they will afford to buy on credit and they will pay bit by bit and then when you're looking into the negatives Businesses can no longer carry out credit marketing, meaning they cannot try to sell goods by focusing directly on selling those goods on credit. They need to give options to the consumers to say you can buy cash or on credit. And then businesses struggle to get credit. Uh, businesses struggle to get credit such as a bank loan and overdraft. So businesses, remember, are, are risk factors. And then some banks will not be able to give for instance small businesses loans which becomes a factor because they would say the business now doesn't have the credit record or the business doesn't have any asset because if a, a business is small it means they have few assets and those few assets cannot now guarantee the bank to say if you lose or whatever business will you be able to pay off because the assets become the source of safety for the business and then when you're looking into another aspect businesses that do not comply with the national credit act may face legal action discriminatory action ways in which now people are different are treated differently so this is now negative this is should this should not be done now discriminatory according to this act is when you are refusing you are discriminating against customers when you are what now when you are refusing credit 
to consumers based on their gender or race. This is discriminating because it means you're not looking into whether the customer qualifies or not, but you're only looking into their gender and race and deciding based on that to say then they don't qualify. And then as we move, charging different interest rates to customers based on the gender or race. So that is also another discriminatory action according to the National Credit Act. This is to say you are charging interest rates based on the gender or race. That is discriminating because it means maybe males are not treated fair or they are treated unfairly because when you are looking into it, it can be, it can say more interest rate for males than then less interest rates for females or more interest rates for females and less interest rates for males. So that is now discriminatory. And then blacklisting customers without making efforts to recover the debt is also discriminatory. Then penalties for those discriminatory action, businesses may demand or may not demand payment or sue or attach the clients or consumer salary in the credit application. Another uh, penalty is that the business may not charge any fee or interest under the specific credit agreement and then the court may declare the granting of credit by the business reckless and may order consumers not to repay. So sometimes businesses would give consumers credit or would approve credit that they were not supposed to approve and then if they do so, it means now the the, 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 the government may decide to say now you as a business you were wrong because you gave consumers credit recklessly even though they were not qualified to get the credit you offered the credit. So consumers should not repay that credit amount because they did not qualify. And then the national credit regulator may impose a fine on businesses for non-compliance, for not checking if a uh, customer uh, affords or not. So those are your non-compliance. This is punishment by the law to the employer or, or the business. Ways to comply with the National Credit Act, offer applicants pre-agreement statements, that is one, and then disclose all costs of loans and no hidden costs should be charged or added after that. And then obtain credit records and checks of clients before granting loans. And then another one is to ensure that businesses should be registered with the National Credit Regulator and then submit an annual compliance report to the National credit regulator those are ways to comply those are ways to follow the law and then those are rules that have to be applied when you are looking into the consumer protection act and then when you're looking into consumer rights in terms of the nca these are the consumer rights apply for credit and to be free from discrimination so this is one of the consumer rights consumers have a right to apply for credit and to be free from discrimination that's one number two receive information in plain and understandable language this talks to now the contracts that are being given to the consumers the information there has to be in a plain language and understandable language as well and then another one, another one is to receive documents as required by the act so they need to receive documents as required by the act and they also have to receive pre-agreement documentation before concluding on any credit transaction and then they also have to obtain reasons for credit being refused if credit was not granted consumers have a right to be given reasons to say why did they fail uh, or why they did not receive that particular credit and then fair and responsible marketing there's a right that consumers have as well and consumers have a right to access and challenge credit records and information and then we look into another consumer law now which is the consumer protection act when you're looking into that act we have consumers what is the main aim of this act is to protect the economic interest of consumers by providing them with information so that they make informed decisions so the aim of the act is to protect the consumers as you can see it acts as the protector of the consumers now we look into the purpose we look into the impact together with the discriminatory action and penalties for non-compliance and ways to comply together with the consumer rights according to the consumer protection act the purpose 
Why was it developed? It was developed because the aim was to protect responsible. It was to promote responsible consumer behavior. That's one. It was to establish national standards for protecting consumers. Another one, it, establish, it establishes a national consumer commission whereby consumers' rights are discussed and they look into different ways in which consumers are protected. It establishes, again, national standards to protect consumers and it promotes and protects the economic interest of consumers by providing access to information so it protects as you see the face mask remember this mask protects you from covid but then we are not talking about covid here we are talking about consumer protection so hence we say it protects the economic interest of consumers by providing access to information hence when you see your product it has this information which is now nutrient information that is provided there to say what energy do you obtain how much fat is there so that people can be able to know and which ingredients are there as well then the impact of consumer protection act what are the positives businesses may be safeguarded from dishonest competitors and then businesses may be protected as well if they are regarded as consumers in their process of buying as well to or from their suppliers it prevents large businesses from undermining smaller ones and then they may gain consumer loyalty if they comply with the consumer protection act however what are the negatives there confidential business information may become available to competitors because remember that information that is granted to the consumers might get, get to the competitors and the competitors might steal some of the key strategies or secret receipts for the business and then penalties for non-compliance may be very high because it might be maybe the issue that the product of the business have caused harm to the consumers and then another one is that businesses may feel unnecessarily burdened by the legal processes and they have to disclose more information about their products and processes and then discriminatory action according to the consumer protection law denying customers proper information about the product or service or treating customers differently based on their gender age or race there's also another uh, discriminatory action charging unfair prices for same goods or services and then another aspect is varying the quality of goods when selling in different areas those are discriminatory because e e e whether you're selling in the urban or in the rural areas you should use uh, the same price Penalties, punishment for not complying with the Consumer Protection Act. A contract may be rendered void or a fine or a term of direct imprisonment may be imposed on the business and then businesses may face fines or imprisonment for a period not exceeding 10 years if they fail to comply with the Act and then government agencies may conduct audits and enact fines or even dissolve your business entirely if you fail to comply and then another punishment would be businesses will be forced to compensate consumers in line with the extent to which their rights have been violated if the product has led maybe to uh, the customer being sick then they have to be compensated for that and then those are penalties for not complying with the consumer protection act and then we look into ways to comply now the business can comply by making sure that they disclose prices of all products on sale and then another one is to provide adequate training to staff on the consumer protection act and this would be basically training on what now on the rights of consumers to say what are the rights of consumers the business should all or the members of staff should all know that so that they make sure that they protect the business and then another one is to make sure that all agreements must be provided for a five-day cooling off period to say if the consumer is not ready or sees that now they are not satisfied with the product after five days or before five days they can return the product and then they should ensure that goods or services offered are standardized and they are of the same service those are rules to comply with the consumer protection act then we look into the consumer rights then after the consumer rights we look into different activities how many consumer rights do we have we have the right to choose we have the right to privacy and confidentiality we have the right to fair and honest dealings we also have the right to information about the product and agreement together with the right to 
fair marketing and the right to accountability from the supplier together with the right to reasonable terms and conditions and consumers also have the right to equality in the uh, consumer market together with the right to return goods and claim refunds together with the right to complain now let's start with the first consumer right the right to choose consumers have the right to choose their supplier or the goods they want to buy they have the right to also uh, shop around for the best price so when you're talking about the consumer right the right to choose it talks to the idea that the consumers can choose their supplier or goods and then it also talks to the idea that they can shop around for the best prices and those become the consumers and then they have a right again to return goods that are unsafe or defective for a full refund or reject goods that are not the same as the sampled or the sample marketed so they have the right to choose they have the right to return the goods they also have the right to shop around for the best price as you can see we have different three different sellers so the consumer has a right to shop around for the best price then the right to privacy and confidentiality consumers have the right there to stop or restrict unwanted direct marketing they can also object to unwanted promotional emails or telesales so that is the right to privacy and confidentiality it talks to the idea that the direct selling can be stopped because the direct selling has implication when it comes to the privacy of the consumer and they can also object unwanted promotional emails or telesales then the right to fair and honest dealings when you're looking into that it protects the consumer because suppliers may not use physical force or harass the customer in the process of buying and then suppliers may not give misleading or false information to the consumers so this has to do with the business trying to be honest or being honest in the process of selling the products to the consumers because if they do not do so then they are violating the consumer's right to fair and honest dealing and then the right to information about the products and agreements when you're looking into that the information can be about the product but it can also be about the agreements which is now the contracts so contracts and agreements should be in plain language and easy to understand language as well and businesses should display the prices which are fully inclusive disclosing all the costs and then businesses should label products and trade descriptions uh, correctly so this has to do with now the trade is uh, trade uh, descriptions which has to do maybe with the the brand of the product being sold and whatever ingredients that are there it also ensures that the, the language in the contracts has to be clear and then the right to fair marketing businesses should not mislead consumers on pricing benefits or uses of the goods and then another one is that consumers may cancel purchases made through direct marketing within five working days or the cooling off period so they can cancel the product made through direct marketing what is direct marketing it is when you receive a phone call and they try to sell maybe a cell phone via the the, the 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 phone call so within the five days such a transaction can be cancelled by the consumer they have the right to do so because when you're looking into such marketing sometimes when they deliver the product they deliver the product that you did not expect hence as a consumer you have a right to say if you have a well, if you have bought any device or you have bought any product via a direct marketing which can be a direct phone call you have a right within the five working days or cooling off period to cancel the purchase before maybe it can also be delivered so that is the right to fair marketing and then the right to accountability from the supplier it, it, it is the right that ensures that consumers have the right to be protected in a lay by agreement to say if anything happens while the product is being laid by it it becomes the responsibility or accountability will be done by the supplier and then the business should honor credit vouchers and prepaid services as well and then the right to reasonable terms and conditions when you're looking into that the consumers have the right to reasonable terms and condition which implies that businesses should provide consumers with a written notices of clauses that may limit consumer rights 
and then another one businesses may not market or sell goods at an unfair prices so those would be your reasonable terms and conditions and then the right to equality in the consumer marketplace that consumer right implies that businesses should not limit access to goods and services and they should make sure that every goods and service that is being offered is given to everyone who buys from that business and then the business should or may not vary the quality of their goods to different consumers the quality has to be the same they should not vary it according maybe to the gender or race that is buying so the product if every consumer is, is experiencing the product to be cold then that product should be cold but if everyone is saying the product is hot then that product should be hot they should not be the difference in in terms of experience so if everyone is saying it's cold then that product should be cold if someone is saying it's hot then everyone should be saying that product is hot then businesses should not discriminate when marketing their products or services in different areas or places and then the consumer right to return goods and claim a refund consumers have a right to do so goods that are unsafe or defective may be replaced by the supplier and then another one is that faulty items may be returned for a full refund because they are faulty meaning faulty means they're not working and then the product should be returned for a full refund meaning receiving the full amount you paid for that product they may return the faulty item if the faulty uh, occurs within the first six months after the purchased item but it depends with the type of product so this is to say refund would be claimed when the business is now trying to fix the matter such as defective products and then the right to complain this is the last consumer right the last consumer right is the right to complain consumers may use various methods or channels to complain about poor quality goods or services so when you're looking into that they can complain via customer care desks or consumer hotlines or ombudsmans that is the channels that are there for consumers to complain for poor quality goods or services so if you are not happy with the product as a consumer you have a right to consume uh, you have a right to complain to say i'm not happy as you can see in the picture the gentleman there is definitely not happy with whatever he or she has bought then uh, we have uh, our activity with this is your typical exam question 1.1 instructs us to say read the scenario below and answer questions that follow we have lolo solar maintenance the management of lolo solar maintenance follows rules as they have they have registered with setters and then lolo solar maintenance also submits the workplace skills plan and they ensure that employees are paid equally for the work of equal value now code two is in which lolo solar maintenance complies with the skills development act from the scenario above then 1.1.2 discuss the impact of skills development lolo solar maintenance as a business and 1.1.3 explain the role of setters in supporting the skills development act so the answers there would be the direct quotations from the scenario the management follows rules as they have registered with the setters that's one mark that's one way to comply and then solar the lolo solar maintenance now submits workplace skills plan that is one as well which makes it to be two for the compliance that is how you basically deal with that but when you look into the last sentence now this sentence we normally call the distract this is the purpose of the labor relation act lra because it is the only purpose that they have which talks about the ensuring that employees are paid equal for work of equal value we don't talk about that when you're looking into the skills development the skills development talks about training being conducted work within the workplace it talks about setters which are authoritarians that deal with training that takes place within the organization now 
let's discuss the impact of the skills development act the positives and negatives it trains employees to improve the productivity in the workplace it promotes self-employment and black entrepreneurship i explained that and then the workplace is used as an active learning environment and then it increases the processes required uh, for uh, it increases the cost as the process requires a large amount of paperwork implementation of the sda can be difficult to monitor and control and then when you're looking into another aspect is that the skills development levy could be an extra burden for a financially struggling business that's eight and then explaining the rules of setters reporting to the director general promoting or establishing learnerships collecting levies and paying out grants as required providing accreditation for skills development facilitators those are considered to be roles of setters for eight marks and then registering learnership agreements or learning programs as well together with approving workplace skills plan and annual training reports now we also have another act and another assessment so i will give you another five minutes to try and solve this one as well try to be fast and provide maybe shorter shorter uh, uh, responses because if i'm saying six here you can provide two if i'm over here you have to identify that act and then here you provide that very very fast and remember that when you're looking into your notes check those responses that are very short which would allow you to be able to respond quicker in your exam so let us look into this one let us look into our first question, outline the consumer rights according to the National Credit Act for six marks. To read the scenario below and answer questions that follow. Let us look into our scenario. We have Pablo Enterprise. Pablo Enterprise sells furniture items. They disclose prices of all products on sale. Moreover, they offer customers a pre-agreement statement. So 2.1 now, identify the act applicable to the scenario above and motivate your answer by quoting from the scenario above. 2.2, explain the impact of the act that is identified in 2.1. When you're looking into that, we'll start by responding to outlining the rights there. But let's focus on the scenario. Pablo Enterprise, they sell furniture items. They disclose the prices of all products on sale. Moreover, they what now? They offer customers pre-agreement statements. So the question is now, which act is applicable there? Is it Consumer Protection Act or is it now your Consumer Protection Act? And what will guide you as a learner to say which act is applicable what guides you is the scenario as you look into ways to comply with the national credit act it talks about disclosing the prices of all products on sale and then moreover they offer customers with what a pre-agreement statement so when you're looking into that your question should be which act is applicable there is it one or two that is for me to find out from you but obviously i can't because i can't talk to you directly but i know you have the answers let us look into the solution for the first one outlining the consumer rights according to the national credit act apply for credit and to be free from discrimination they also consumers have the right according to the national credit act to receive information in plain and understandable language they also have the right to receive documents as required by the act and they also have the right to receive agreements or documentation before conducting any credit transaction together with obtaining reasons for credit being refused and they have the right to fair and responsible marketing together with accessing and challenging any credit records or information so when you look into that one this is how this is how it would be marked two ticks at the end why because of the verb there the action verb is outlined so all the others will be looked at as max and then you get your six marks there those are the rights of consumers according to the national credit act then read the scenario below and answer questions that follow the act there is the national credit act because it talks about disclosing all information on the credit contract and it also talks about what uh, uh, consumers pre-agreement statements
So that's one for the motivation and true and remember within the two any is correct and then looking into the impact what are the positives there low bad debts resulting in better cash flow it protects the business against non-paying consumers another one is authorized credit providers may attract more customers it leads to more customers through credit sales as they have now protection from abuse and the negatives when you're looking into that businesses can no longer carry out credit marketing another aspect is that businesses struggle to get credit such as bank loans or overdrafts and then another one is that businesses do not that do not comply with the national credit act may face legal action so we split the marks there because of the verb then you get your six there we have another activity we have a scenario now now let us look into the summary of our lesson. We, I had questions there from you guys. Uh, we have acts and every act is important because uh, one of you asked a question to say, which act should you guys focus on? I cannot limit you when it comes to that. I can only tell you that each and every act is important. So when you're looking into a skills development, remember you will know the critical five concepts and the five critical concepts is your purpose, is your impact, discriminatory action, and we also have penalties for non-compliance. But then what is critical to look into as well is the extended parts of each act, like these aspects. I'll highlight these aspects here. They are the extended because this is not the typical way in which you analyze your act. This is not the purpose. This is not the impact. This is not the discriminatory actions. Hence, when you're looking into skills development, what is highly assessed in most times is the rules of setters, is the funding of setters, is the meaning of learnerships. So when you're looking into this, this can be your multiple your multiple choice question funding of setters can be your section b national skills and human resource this is mostly assessed in your column a and column b so when you're looking into that column a and b so look into those roles of setters they can be assessed in that as your multiple choice or as your section b that is for skills development but all the other aspects it doesn't mean you exclude them and then when you look for instance into your employment equity act what becomes critical there is your purpose your impact your compliance non-compliance discriminatory action and again to look into the word affirmative action when you see affirmative action you should know we are talking about employment equity act because affirmative action talks about making sure that those who were previously uh, disadvantaged in the process of employment they should be considered especially when they are qualified and suitable so that is part of now your employment equity act but when you look into another act which is for instance your labor relations you look into the people's impact compliance non-compliance and when you're looking into compliance and discriminatory action those two for instance are similar in a way because discriminatory actions are basically a, a business that is not complying but compliance has to do now with ways that are not discriminating on some of the members of the community or members of the business which is the employees so when you're looking into that you should know that the discriminatory action together with the compliance cannot be asked in one exam so you should make sure that you differentiate between the two and then when you're looking into labor relation you can also look into the rights the employer and employees rights according to the labor relation they can be asked you can be asked to explain them you can be asked to take them or identify them from the scenario then develop maybe for instance other ways or other consumer uh, employers rights that are there or employees rights that are there so you look into those you do not exclude those when you're preparing for a labor relation when you talk about now for instance your 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 broad-based black economic empowerment your pillars become very very key because for you to understand the act you need to understand the pillars and remember you have five pillars which is your ownership management control you also have your 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 skills development remember ownership management control skills development you also have enterprise and supplier development and socio-economic development so you look into those pillars and say how can they be applied what is the implication to the business this is about how the business should implement those pillars to ensure equal distribution of wealth 
and uh, resources within the nation. So those are your pillars. But then when you look into Coyota, what is key there with your compensation for Occupational Injuries and Disease Act, you need to make sure that you look into the papers, the impact, compliance, non-compliance, discriminatory and penalties for non-compliance. So you look into those. And then when you're looking into your National Credit Act and the Consumer Protection Act, you look into what we just addressed, the consumer rights and the consumer rights for the uh, consumer protection and according to the National Credit Act. Those two are not similar. And then when you look into national, the two we addressed. So let me sum it up because we have it here with us. You know the purpose, the impact, the discriminatory action, penalties and ways to comply together with the consumer rights according to National Credit Act. Please do not uh, confuse those. And then consumer protection, you know the purpose, the impact, the discriminatory actions, the penalties for non-compliance, ways to comply and the consumer rights. And then when you're looking into the consumer rights, just know that you can be asked to identify these consumer rights from a scenario or statement. But when you're looking into your National Credit Act and the consumer rights there, you cannot be asked to identify them from the statement. Yes, maybe from a scenario by quoting them, but you will not be asked to identify. So you can be asked to identify what is the right to choose. Or you can be asked to identify the right to privacy and confidentiality, the right to fair and honest dealings, the right to information about the product and agreement, the right to fair marketing, the right to accountability from the supplier, together with the right to reasonable terms and conditions and equity in the consumer market, together with the right to goods and claiming of refund. So those are your consumer rights according to the consumer protection act so this is the end of the presentation thank you for watching